Well, hello everyone and welcome to Signature Style Saturday. I have to tell you that I'm feeling really good because even though you won't see it till tomorrow, um, on Friday, we filmed what I am considering to be really the last of the pro major projects at the cottage. I called Hubs, who's on a fishing adventure, and I said, we are done. I am done. Uh, we moved in December 27th and Kayla and I were talking and six to seven months to the date we started this garden, the garden is done. And I am pinching myself because I really cannot believe that it has come to fruition. And yes, it does contain lots of my signature style. So what are we going to talk about today? Well, today it's all about hook up. It's all about September blue. It's about thinking about really comfy, cozy, the precursor to fall. We're going to talk about well, as you know, I, one of my signature obsessions is candles, candle lights, specifically tapers. And we're going to talk about all sorts of different hacks and tips and tricks related to candle use, to candle accoutrement, and yes, some of it in my signature blue. We're going to talk a little bit about a project that's getting ready to happen next week week, but I want to discuss it with you first because Kayla is actually going to film it. Leah and I are going to do some high C black workout, or not workout boots, work boots, I guess. Um, we're going to style them in two different ways. Of course, I've got my lesson of the week, what I am reading, what I am listening to, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so what do you say, Stuart? Let's do it. Let's do it. Well, what am I reading this week? really exciting things. Number one, I finally got my own copy. Um, I'm surprised I didn't get one earlier because I wrote the foreword to The Cottage Garden by my buddy Klaus Dalmi, the Martha Stewart of Denmark. And the images in here are just wonderful. I cannot wait to read it in its entirety because yes, I do have a cottage garden of my own. It was really a privilege to be asked. It was my honor to do so. And yeah, so it, it's just an, it's, it was an act of love uh, for me to write the forward, but mostly an act of love on Klaus's part, who is just, um, incomparable in his talents and in his design skills. Um, so that is what I am anxious to dive into. I have already started to dive into a wonderful book. It's a New York Times bestseller, The Creative Act, A Way of Being by Rick Rubin. Now, Stuart, tell us who Rick Rubin is. Well, he's uh, a music producer who's done a lot of pop music over the last, you know, three or four decades and then it's just now become very influential in the create just the kind of the, the way creative, of creative thinking yeah. yeah yeah and I think I learned about him on a podcast and then I was telling Leah that I was reading this book and you had already heard about the book yeah. you can also get it on audiobook from your library but I needed a copy best because of course I like to mark up my books I like to highlight things that really speak to me and it seems to me like I am highlighting almost <laughs> every other line in it. It is just chock full of really, really good stuff. So that is what I am recommending, the creative act, a way of being. And by the way, I am loving my new markers. I told you about these. I love the fact that they highlight in a more subtle way. They're kind of not in the fa in your face like the fluorescent ones. And these are by Alahaster. And of course, we will put a link to all of these things. Um, um, in the description box below, I also want to share with you something that I'm very excited about and also something I got this week, and that is an early copy of my garden journal. And it shows exactly how it is laid out. It shows all of the different categories where you can inventory your tools, your seeds, your plantings. It's got all sorts of conversion tables. It's got um, oh, areas where you can put in the dates of when you planted what. But most importantly to me, let me go to the ribbon divider to today's date. So for example, on September 16th, 
which is right here. It's got two days per page and you can make notes and then compare those notes on any given day from one year to the next over a period of five years. And I'm, I think it's just so invaluable. So one year it might be 100 degrees on this day and another day it might be 73 degrees as a high, but you can compare year to year. And I think what that really does is help us identify trends over time. And from a practical standpoint, as you start using it, when to do what and also chronicle ideas that you have for the next year. So I'm really, really excited about it. You can pre-order it now. My big ask, it really helps when you pre-order and we will of course put a link below. And if you have not already got your copy of The Elegant and Edible Garden, it and a number of other garden books are on deep discount on Amazon right now. I think Leah, my book was like for $18 and Container Gardens by Klaus was $17. Um, so they're on deep discount now. So you really want to jump on and take the opportunity to get some of your maybe uh, books that you have wanted for a while on your wish list and, and also stock up maybe for some Christmas gifts. So there you go. That is what I am reading this week. And what I learned this week, it's kind of humbling and I'm a little bit embarrassed to share, but I'm going to anyway. And there are two things that I learned this week. You will see tomorrow that we have really been working hard to get the backyard planted and pretty much to get the last, um, Oh, the last things installed, the mulch down, all that kind of thing in the backyard. And it's it's been a real team effort. So it's been Sergio and Javier and Kayla and myself. And for two days straight, we worked like dogs. I mean, really heavy physical labor. So, um, so n number one, here here is, I guess, my lesson from that. And that is, I shouldn't I need to be very careful when I work really hard like that and I get overly tired. And at the end of the day, let's just say I can not be very nice. I can be not very nice. Um, and I just was really harsh with hubs when I, when I came, came in. Something really frustrated me. I was tired and let's just say I was a witch with a B. And, um, and I hurt his feelings and I, I, I think it was because in my defense, it was because I was really, really overly tired and you know how something will happen and it just kind of trips your trigger when you're really tired. So I need to be careful about that when I am doing lots of physical labor outside and I'm, I'm kind of feeling like a martyr and I need to be careful about that. And the next morning I had to suck it up and apologize and promise I'd go fishing with hubs. <laughs> <laughs> to make up for it. So I think that was one lesson learned. The other lesson learned um, on a lighter note is I just, it is just a mistake, even though we all do it. I know you do it because on pretty days, we cannot resist first thing in the morning, going outside with our coffee cup or our cup of tea and going outside and checking on the garden because we are just magnetically drawn to it. And last week, there were a couple of times when I got out here early and I was still in my pajamas. And then I just continued to work out here in my pajamas, not getting dressed until later in the morning. And then I have a hard time getting my day started and I don't wanna go inside. And, um, and then sometimes I know people are, are stopping by the cottage or, or coming by and, and I know it's foolish, it's a silly thing, but I need to at least before I come outside, first thing, don't allow myself, even if I'm just coming out here to meditate or something, don't allow myself uh, pajama time out in the garden um, because it, it's, it just doesn't end prettily all the time. I need. <laughs> I need to have at least basic gym clothes on. Um, Leah, does that make any sense to you? Yeah, yeah, I love pajamas. <laughs> I know, I know, and we all we all do it. But I just I just noticed that that it would enhance the enhance the quality of my life if I would 
if I would just put on clothes before I went ahead and came outside. Because I am like a little kid who wakes up in the morning and the first thing I want to do is rush outside. So that's kind of a, a, my question of the day. Do you guys experience that same kind of conflict with <laughs> within yourself and half the day has gone by and you're outside in your pajamas and um, and then you have to scurry inside to put on clothes when a visitor or someone comes by. So that those are two, two lessons that I learned this week. Well, Leah and I haven't done a my way, her way in quite a while, but we both just got a new pair of high C garden boots and we thought we would style them my way, her way. Now, my way is also considerably <laughs> muddier and dirtier than her way. Mine will get there. They'll yeah, get yours, there. Will, yours will get there. Hers are just in basic black. Mine are in, I don't really know what color that is. It's, it's um, kind of gray blue. Kind blue, of a gray, gray blue. It's traumatized color it's because I've been cottage wearing them outside yeah but it's got this kind of fun botanical motif now i love it that it's got these little hooks these little canvas handles on the back that helps you pull them on but Do what i love it? about these okay <laughs> leah i told you about these when we got them mm -hmm. easy on I easy know. off all right let's take a risk leah. they're right. also so comfortable they are so comfortable Look how easy it is yeah they have got great <laughs> yes Yes, great padding on the inside. I don't know if oh, you can see so that. So comfortable. Yeah, I don't know if you can see it or There's not. There's like little shapes in there that yes. form oh, here. Yes, but. and I, you know, I'm all about the walking life, and I, I have worn these walking around yeah. in, into They're Midtown. They're so comfy. I know, they are so comfortable. Now, the other thing, because I've, I've had these for quite a while, the other thing I love about them is you can wear them with really thick socks, mm -hmm. and in the wintertime, they are great snow and ice yeah, boots. Yeah, I'm ready to wear these in the yeah. Turn. Yeah, they've got great tread, but yet they're still not too heavy like some. Yep. Some can be, but I also think they're darn cute. They are cute. So here is how I styled mine, albeit they are kind of dirty. So this is another piece that I am obsessed with right now, you guys. Uh, my friend Deborah, my, my bestie, she gave me this in what color? In your September blue. In September blue. I absolutely love it. It is so comfortable. It's kind of a Lululemon knockoff. It's called Las Lulu. And I will put a link. <laughs> Sounds like it. Las Lulu. It's a dupe. We it's, call it's that a, a dupe. dupe. Okay, it's a dupe. And it's, it's gosh, it was like $34 or something. It, I cannot tell you it's very nice how comfortable quality. it is. It, it feels so rich. I adore adore the collar on it. I think it is just it's absolutely so darling and you can wear it obviously all the way zipped up. Or You, you can... ordered it in another color, right? I loved it so much, yes, <laughs> yes. Well, Deborah gave me this one and then I liked it so much that I, I got it in white also. And a little behind the scenes story, Deborah actually saw these on a girl. She was flying to Montana and there was a gal on the airplane that had one and she asked her where she got yeah. it. She said the girl looked so chic. She had it in a white one on with just black leggings. She looked so Cute. comfortable and so chic. So she asked her where she got it. Deborah, and the good girl, job. yeah, the girl spilled the beans on it. But I really think it's just I really cute. It. Okay, some other little features. I didn't even realize this till Leah just That's pointed this out to me. Yep. Yeah, thumb. yes, it's got the thumb holes. I so just, good. yes, I I love that. I love the boxiness of it. Mm -hmm. I I love it's a the good fact. Cut. But yeah, so if you were, are wearing high-waisted jeans or a high-waisted skirt yep. or something like that, or I've got mine paired with just Athleta leggings, yep. and then I think the boots look kind of cute with it. Yeah. It's, it's kind of a garden, garden athleisure, Love garden it. athleisure <laughs> styled, and I've got it with a touch of gold and black bead earrings. And then I've got an Armatron. Just I kind of still like. I'm, I, they may not be Pop fashionable anymore. I don't care. I uh, like. I like big. Back. Yeah, I like big faced back. Yeah. watches. So, um, so there is my ensemble. I think I've gotten everything. Okay, take it away, Leah. Okay, I'm leaving here and going to the vintage market today. So I styled the boots up a little bit to okay. wear to the market. So I have some flare pants. These are from Madewell, but there are some good pairs on other sites too. Yeah, yeah. and pro that's probably something you could get thrifting. Yeah, yeah. And then I have this little flowy pirate top, which I bought online. My usual jewelry and a headscarf. 
because you all loved my headscarf last time, so yeah, I thought I'd yeah. bring it back. And you won't recognize uh, this uh, this reference, but it's very Rhoda Morgenstern. Yes. It's very Rhoda Morgenstern from the Mary it. Tyler Moore show. I love the accessory of a scarf. Yeah, and you Linda look just got me a so I cute did get bandana. her. I so cute. We'll show that next time. Yes. We will show and that I next time. And I wore it time. last night. It's so cute. It is. It is really pretty cute. I, I I saw it at the Hatch Chili Festival, and I it was. Let's just say it was a signature touch yes, for you, and thank it was you. it was absolutely darling. Don't you just love to find the perfect little present for little smile presents yeah, for people? I so love it. Um, these boots definitely make us smile. We will put links in the description box below. They are some of my favorite garden boots I think you cannot be too thin you cannot be too rich and you can also not have too many garden yeah, boots I was gonna say I think tulips. my mom has about four pairs of these there's some with chickens on them and she raises birds so she has like yeah, four the yellow pairs ones of, yeah, and, they're but they're yellow. they're lower cut yes. yeah yeah okay, and she just slips them on and goes out okay, to her let's, chickens let's put a let's put a pair of those on because yes. I think a lot of you would like would like yeah. that color. So there you go. There is our my way her way. Yeah. Well, here is a little tease for a segment that we're going to show you coming up probably next week, and that is how I get my signature green grass look in the fall and in the spring. Now, right now, the Bermuda just is looking pretty good. This is just common Bermuda. Uh, it's mowed. I keep it fertilized with melorganite. It's pretty much weed free. We worked on that when we first moved into the cottage. But pretty soon, as you guys know, Bermuda, which is a commonly used grass in this area, the Bermuda will start turning brown as it goes dormant for the winter. Now, those of us that want to have a really green lawn through most of fall, a little bit of green in the winter, and then a really beautiful spring green in spring, we need to take measures now to be able to have that. Because for me, having a brown Bermuda yard when the whole pageantry of the tulips and all of the spring show begins just does not match. It really doesn't create the canvas upon which I want that spring show to shine. And so what we will be doing this week, and for, for me, um, when I used to have real turf at the other house, I would do it about September 15th. So it was September 15th yesterday, and so we're starting to look at that window of time where if you want to overseed your Bermuda lawn with a perennial rye seed, or you have a fescue lawn and you need to rejuvenate it by overseeding it again with more fescue seed, then now is the time to do it. So how do we do that? Well, Kayla will describe it in detail next week. I um, have some obligations and she's gonna be doing it for me. But what you do is scalp the Bermuda really low and it will then look kind of brown, but you scalp it really, really low. You do that so that there can be good seed to turf or seed to dirt, I should say, contact so that the seed can germinate. Now she is going to be using a variety of a perennial ryegrass. I can't remember the name. I used to use Arnold Palmer, um, but she will share all of the details with you. But what you basically do is you just really, really skim the surface, get it as short as possible. Then you come back in and with either a in small areas like this, either with a drop spreader or by hand, you just sprinkle the seed. And then what we do is we save the clippings from scalping the turf and we then cover that seed with the clippings of the grass 
and then we just keep it watered and wait till it germinates and it can depending on the weather it can happen in as little as three days uh, up to seven days if you get a really good rain that's not that's a gentle rain and doesn't wash away the seed then you've got the best conditions there are and immediately it starts getting this just veneer of this beautiful pale green and it is so fun to watch it is one of the things I always used to look forward to and I am definitely looking forward to it again here at the cottage on the hill she'll be doing that next week and I won't fertilize it or anything now I will just let that the grass clippings break down and be the nitrogen source. What I will do is in February, I will come back and give it an application of melorganite, which is an organic nitrogen source. So all of this is going to happen in the next two weeks, but if you wanna do it along with me, then make sure that you stay tuned and Kayla will share with you the entire how-to. If you've got a really large yard, you might wanna use a broad broadcast spreader. So there's a difference between a drop spreader and a broadcast spreader. The broadcast spreader literally broadcasts the seed everywhere. A drop spreader drops it vertically down into place. Now why is that important? Because if I used a broadcast spreader, all of that seed would not only go on the turf, it would go into my flower beds and I don't want that. So a drop spreader, I can literally walk along the edge and it will drop it vertically down. It won't broadcast it everywhere. I wanted to go ahead and give you those tips just in case you wanna make some of your own preparations and you wanted to overseed your lawn this fall. Well, a lot of you often asked if I have an issue with things like bugs and critters coming in along with me when I cut branches or big bouquet of flowers or anything, basically nature sources, pine cones, acorns, with, a, with bugs coming inside. Well, sure I do. And, <laughs> and that's, just part, that's just part of the program. Case in point, let me share with you a history that I share with this little praying mantis right here. And I'm surprised it's still here. So here is my history. I was putting together, I cut a big bouquet of zinnias this morning and I brought it in and I was arranging them. And I noticed that this, this praying mantis right here was on one of the zinnias. So I didn't want to kill it. My friend Carrie the Bug Whisperer would have been very unhappy if I killed it, but I didn't want to touch it either. <laughs> so I thought I can maybe just gently enclose my clippers around it, getting somewhere along its thoracic cavity, and I can just pick it up and I can take it outside. So I so I started to do that. And I thought, oh no, I've squeezed it too tight and I've squished it and I've killed it. So I threw it in the trash. But no, oh, wow. <laughs> it was stunned, it was not dead. <laughs> so, so then I reached back down in there and I got it once again with my clippers right there at the part where it gets wide at the bottom. And I picked it up and I brought it out here. And for a moment, and I'm not that squeamish, but for a moment it started crawling up my hand and that I think they are kind of creepy looking and that kind of made me squeal and I opened the door and I threw it out here and I did not know praying mantises had wings. How did I not know that? But I had, I had scared the wings out of it because the wings then opened up and it just, I, I checked it to see if it was, if I had harmed it in any way. No, it was just kind of hanging out around here and it's been hanging out kind of here on the steps ever since and yet I've seen it move and it seems none the worse for wear. So when Leah saw <laughs> this praying mantis, I said, oh, this praying mantis and I, we have a history together. <laughs> we spent the morning together. I should have invited it for coffee, but I didn't. So it had a couple of close calls. It went in the trash. <laughs> it was almost snipped by my, my clippers, my little, what are my favorite clippers called? that we sold out of, um, I think, Bergen and Ball, I think they're, they're available again. Um, but there you go. There is a little praying mantis story uh, to start out your weekend. 
Well, it has been so fun styling the cottage for fall and I wanted to do the parlor, I may have shared this with you before, all in creams and hydrangea tones. So let's start out with the mantle. I got all white pumpkins, these little ghost pumpkins. Um, I don't know what variety these are, but I gave them just a little hint, a little whisper of a glossy enamel veneer on them. I sprayed them outside. That helps capture the sunlight or capture the candlelight as the case may be. And I've lit these candles because in the evening it's really, really lovely. And then it's just basically a study in this kind of limey green, a little bit of buff tones as some of the hydrangeas start browning. And then I just clipped a branch from Miss Lemon Abelia. Then I have this, this swan gourd that I just think has so much personality, so much, so much personality. Crazy. I can see it kind of looking down here at the tableau that I've created. There's even a little spot right there that it looks Eyeballs. like an eye. Uh-huh, uh-huh. The and then there's an apple gourd here just in green and white and just some little dried lovelies from the garden. So it's very simple, it is very plain, and I love it for this, the, the sub-season of fall, the first part of fall, when we're really not into the really deep russet, mahogany, cardinal, um, amber tones of what I think to be late fall. This is still fresh. It still speaks to both late summer and early fall, and I love the way it looks. Now, I wanted to set that same kind of thematic in other areas and repeat it in other places in the parlor. So I've got another green and white swan gourd over here that looks very architectural. It looks like a piece of sculpture, I think. In framed in front of this bowl, which by the way was a TJ Maxx find many, many years ago. And I didn't wanna I didn't wanna overdo it. I know in, in fall it's all about abundance in late summer and early fall. So I used just a couple of pumpkins right here and have them stacked, but there's more than enough room for if you are here enjoying a beverage, a cup of tea or something, more than enough room on this surface to be able to place your drink. And then as I told you earlier, this was the bouquet that I was putting together with my friend, the praying mantis. <laughs> this is all again about those creamy late summer tones. I love the way this looks. The hydrangeas are repeated over here. A branch of this Miss Lemon Abelia now blooming in white is also represented. I love the russet tones of the branch. These are echoed in the drying flowers of Sedum Autumn Joy here with just a hint of late summer pink left, but they're starting to dry. I love the way it looks from the side when you walk in the door, but I also love the way it looks, Stuart, when you are taking it from above. Let me, let me remove that so you can see how pretty it looks. So when I'm walking through, I can see it, and from above, it looks every bit as beautiful. Now, one, um, one practical note. You guys asked me about this glass frog that I have in here that um, actually this was a gift from a friend of mine and I, I have looked for them and I haven't been able to find them, but I did find some clear plastic ones and actually I have ordered a couple of those and I will put a link to them below because they are just wonderful when you want something very subtle, um, very unobtrusive and you want to be able to showcase the stems and the beauty in a clear glass vase. So I think it makes the entire composition really look elegant and really speak to the season, as does this large blue bouquet of these dried hydrangeas here in the window in a blue and white cash po. I think they look really beautiful. And in the morning, I light this candle. I am all about candles right now. And I light that candle as I meditate in the morning in the parlor. Candles are lit whatever my location is for meditation in the morning. And then lastly, I've got another blue and white and hydrangea tableau that you see when you come in. And if I'm having someone over for a glass of wine or whatever, just a girlfriend or 
maybe just hubs, then I can put the bottle of wine here and I've got a couple of wine glasses at the ready. Again, with more of the repeat of the hydrangeas and the white pumpkins. And of course, my September blue candle. Now let's talk about candle, candle habits, candle etiquette. Um, and let's just do a little research on how we can use candles in our home. Well, if you have followed me for any length of time, you know that I am absolutely candle obsessed, whether they're solar, battery operated, or yes, even real wax candles. And I am, I think it's this time of year that they speak to me especially because they give that kind of hygge vibe. Leah, do you know what I mean? That's just so comfortable, it's so cozy. And I think it is just one of life's simple pleasures, life's little luxuries, if you will, to just engage in the act of lighting a candle. I think it's just a fun thing. And they are great uh, companions. If I'm alone in the cottage or alone anywhere, meditating in the morning or later in the afternoon, I just like having the company of a small flame. And that may seem kind of odd, but nevertheless, I think it's true. And it's definitely something that the Scandinavians have down pat. So I'm kind of channeling two different things right now. September blue, and then just the beauty, the simple elegance of candlelight as a signature touch. So you guys know that I absolutely love taper candles in particular. I love all candles, but taper candles in particular. One thing that I did this year was as a little life luxury, I treated myself to kind of an ombre version of September blue candles. They're in all different shades of blue, and I love them. You can also get them in different shades of green and what, what other colors do they have? I think maybe pink. So whatever color palette speaks to you, it's a real fun thing to just celebrate the month with, I think. It's not something I would probably do year round because usually I just use a basic ivory candle, but I nevertheless think it's a really fun, special thing to do, especially in, in the months where it's not really a holiday. It's just one of those quiet, quiet times of the year, and I love that. Equally as obsessed am I with these what look to be kind of blown glass candle holders. I saw these someplace, I can't remember, I think in a Chicago museum, I saw something similar and I came across a picture of them in my photo albums not too long ago and I just looked online to see if I could find anything similar and I did. Stuart likes them because they've got kind of a kind of a laboratory vibe to them. I think they, and they do, but there's also kind of this, this elegant synergy that they have. So they're both practical and kind of laboratoire, but also just very, very blown glass, beautiful. These, um, we were trying to decide what color to call these, but I just called them brown because that's the color that they were called when I ordered them. But I was equally, I was really torn between getting these and the yellow ones, which this time of year would just be beautiful. But I'm so glad I got the brown ones because I just, I just have to share this give, these kind of weird things. I know I'm silly, but they give me such incredible joy. And I love the way these September blue candles look in these brown blown glass or maybe not blown glass, but blown glass inspired glass candlesticks with my Monument Valley painting behind them. I think they absolutely look very, very exquisite. And then I've just added a little bouquet of kind of dusty pink zinnias. Um, now, taper candles aren't, aren't the only thing, but they definitely have a zeitgeist all of their own. And there is something that constitute good, that constitutes good candle etiquette, whether it's taper candles, whether it's votive candles, whether it's pillar candles. And some of those things are going to be outlined in a downloadable, really fun little um, template or, or something that Leah's, a little file that Leah is putting together. And we will have, to have it as a downloadable file that you can print out 
in my newsletter, um, maybe in the community tab, but definitely if you haven't already subscribed to my newsletter, just go to www.lindavotter.com and you'll be able to download it and print it out. And what a great gift that would be to print that out and give them with some special candle holders or some really special candles to, to a loved one. It would make a great housewarming gift. If you're going to dine with someone, for a dinner party or something, a birthday gift, just a smile gift to give to someone. I think it's beautiful. And make the candles, particularly the, ta the taper candles, really special so you can get these kind of ombre color inspired one. You guys know earlier in the season, I was all about different kinds of spiral candles. And we will put links to all of these in the description box below. And also we will be talking about a lot of these on Instagram this week. They are just something that makes candles that much more special. Not for every day, but maybe for the month, the month of September. Another kind of candle that I like are these long, I think of them as spaghetti candles. And these would make, wouldn't these just be so dramatic? Oh, this guy, no, it's not. I thought it was missing its wick. But wouldn't these be great as au naturel, um, really dramatic birthday candles? I use them a lot when I'm meditating and I will just put a little bit of adhesive on the bottom of that bottom of them, set them in any kind of flame proof vessel and they're just sweet. And they, I don't know, you can kind of make a little altar with them. I love these. We'll also put a link to these. A friend of mine's daughter came over and saw them and just went wild. So I gifted her, they come in a set of, I think like 50 or 60, something like that. But I gifted her a box, really rustic, simple elegance. They come in a brown paper box. I wrapped it up with twine and I just think it was a really fun, fun little smile gift. Now, in terms of candle etiquette and candle best practices, first of all, safety first. You never want to leave a lit candle unattended. And I have done that in the past. So here is a candle hack, if you will. What I've started doing is setting a timer. So if I've got a candle lit inside, and then as I am want to do, I am going to go outside and I'll go back and forth and then I'll get captivated by something that I'm doing outside and I won't come back inside for another 30 minutes or so. What I do is when I light a candle, I then set a timer and that timer then reminds me if I'm going outside to come back in and snuff out the candle or just as a reminder that I've got a candle lit in some place in the house. It's not so much a problem in the cold of the winter when I'm inside and I'm not outdoors as much, but if I'm kind of migrating between interior and exterior spaces, then I really want to be careful that I remember that I've got a candle lit. It's also especially imperative if you're going to be leaving the house. Just set a timer as a reminder that you've got a candle lit. Now, another thing that you want to do is make sure to not only have a beautiful flame, um, but also one that isn't a dangerous flame, and that is that you trim the wick. So you trim the wick, again, regardless of what type of candle it is, down to about a quarter inch. When I was in Alexandria, Virginia, I got these very kind of New England-inspired candle snuffers and a candle trimmer. Now you can also find these online. I got them because they reminded me of my trip. But again, this would make just a brilliant gift with a set of candles. What I love about this candle wick snipper is that what it does is it cuts the wick, but then it contains it in that little recess. So it doesn't fall back into the well of the candle and it doesn't fall on the floor. And you can just then take it and you can um, throw it in the trash. So I really like these. I think they've got, oh, kind of a rustic, maybe a farmhouse sheet to them. And I think they just really look elegant sitting out. Now, these are other things that are wonderful. Stuart calls this reverse thrifting. It's one of those things that you may like it so much that you think you have it on a permanent thrift 
list and we're going to start composing a permanent thrift list, aren't we, Leah, of things that every time we go to the thrift store, we're going to be looking for them. And case in point are these candle snuffers. Now, this candle snuffer, I actually got as a gift from a follower and they sent it to me and I just, I love it. And I have this in a different location in the great room, but I have them all around the house because they just are brilliant in snuffing out your candle. That way, and one of the reasons we don't wanna just blow the candle out, have you, I remember my mother doing this. She would always put her hand behind the candle before she blew a candle out. That is so the wax spray doesn't go everywhere. But not only do I not want the wax spray to go everywhere, I also don't want any hot wax spray to go on my hand. And so that's what you have a candle snuffer for. I think that's really, really important. And it is just a touch of elegance. If you are a good chatelain of your home, then you definitely need to have a good candle snuffer. Likewise, you want to protect not only the candles, but you also want to protect the candlesticks. So if you are using brass candlesticks, glass candlesticks, anything that you really want to protect from the candle wax itself, then you might want to purchase some of these bobeches. These are glass. I have, you can get them in quantity. I think they come about 12 to a pack. Leah, let's make sure that we put a link to these and I need to reorder some because what they do is you just put them over the taper candle and then when the wax drips, it waxes onto the bobesh, not onto the candlestick themselves. Now in this case, I don't like the look of it, so I'm going to remove it. But for some of my other candlesticks, I definitely always want to protect them with some kind of bobesh. Now, another reason you might want to protect them is, um, is I one of the things I always look for when I'm thrifting, and that's old candelabras, things of that nature. Sometimes those candelabras are made out of a, of a, a product that might catch on fire, believe it or not. They might be wood, they might be some kind of composite, and so you definitely want to protect those with some kind of glass bobesh or inflammable protector so that they don't flame on. And I think that's very, very important. So these are another thing that I like to stock up on, not only um, year round, but also especially I think around the candle season, the holiday season, when you want to have plenty of them on hand. And sometimes when they get hot, if the candle has been lit for a while, then they will crack. And so you want to make sure that you've got replacements. Now, a couple of little candle hacks. <clears throat> we have all burned votive candles, and then we are challenged by getting the little metal, metal bottom of the candle out of it, or we just can't get the wax removed. Well, here's a couple of hacks for that. You want to pour just a little bit of water into the basin of your votive candle. That makes it eminently easier to remove then after the votive has run its course. Now, another hack is when you order votive candles in quantity like I do, don't have them delivered on a day that's 100 degrees <laughs> because, because this is what will happen. They will all melt together if you are not there to, well, actually I got this delivery right away, but they were on a hot truck and they melted together like ice cubes. And then now I have to segregate them. I have to use kind of like an ice pick to separate them and they don't fit 100% evenly into the votive cup. Nevertheless, I am still going to be burning these. When I say I get them in quantity, folks, I get them in quantity. And we will put a link to these because I am one of those goofy people that does like they do in the movies. And if I'm taking a bubble bath at night and I really want to indulge myself, then I will have candles all over the place in my bathroom. Leah, do you do that sometimes? Yeah, I think it's, it's, um, it's just a, it's a little life luxury. Okay, so then you light your match and then when you get ready to remove the remains of the votive, 
it is far easier to do. I also like to collect little tiny bowls that I set around. This is another thing on my permanent thrifting list that I set around color coordinated, of course, in different locations to drop my matches or the wick tips. This is a tiny little blue and white bowl that was gifted to me by my daughter-in-law, Delphia. And I've put it on and I think they just look so pretty. And talk about an easy centerpiece. These look just so pretty on this September blue tray. The other nice thing about it is you can carry the tray if you are going to position all of these beautiful light blue uh, votive candles in different areas around your house. I got these off of Amazon, I believe, but I was inspired by an image that again, and this is another reason to go through at the beginning of the month, go through that month's photos in your iPhoto, however you categorize and inventory your photos, go through them because you will be inspired by things you have done before. And one thing that I did before was I would take these kind of channeled votive cups and I would position them in the morning or at dusk and in a semi-dark room. They make this just brilliant pattern on a wood table, on whatever um, a solid surface that you have. And so not only is the candlelight beautiful, but the pattern that the votive cup makes is equally as beautiful and compelling. And I came across that because I had taken some images of them. That's what I love about this set that again, you can get in different colors, but I love it because each one will make a different pattern depending on the motif and the bas relief of the edges of the glass. And I think that's a fun thing to do. Again, a brilliant little gift. This would also be fun to get a set of these and then divide them up and use them as stocking stuffers. So put one in one and another one in the other and kind of match the person's personality to the different little votive cup. Another part of garden of, excuse me, not garden etiquette, but candle etiquette is if you are burning a large pillar candle or one of the ultimate, this is not a little luxury. This is a big luxury. These are artisanal candles. Uh, my friend Deborah got me one as a housewarming gift when I first moved into the cottage and I burned it all winter long. It was kind of my, my queen's flag. If the candle was lit, the queen was at home. If the candle was not lit, the queen was away. And I absolutely loved it. It was so special and it was very much a morning ritual of mine to make my coffee in the morning and light my candle. Now, a thing of a uh, thing about garden, uh, or excuse me, I keep saying garden, Leah, candle etiquette is that when you first burn the candle, you want to burn it for a full, uh, what did it say, four hours? Um, and that will make what is a, a proportional symmetrical well. So another reason, and I just learned this the other day, this was one of those kind of trivia things. Who knew there was so much to learn about candle care, but you know, when you blow out a candle, or you light a candle with one of those, um, what are they called? The clicker, the, the, yeah, the clicker candle. Okay, when you light them, what that does is it gives a burst of heat that then chars the outside of the channel that you have created in a beautiful candle. And you don't want that blacking on inside the well of your candle. So that is when you want to use a match. Leah's going, who knew? That is when you want to use a match. And for candles that have a deep well or for candles by your fireplace, or when you're lighting your, lighting your wood fire, then you definitely want to use a fireplace match. And I talked about that as well. To me, that is a little life luxury to use a fireplace match that's compostable rather than one of those clicking igniters. It is so much more sensual, it is so much more romantic, and it is so much more of a little luxury. Matches in general, I think, are a fun thing to collect and very much a lot life, um, a life pleasure. If you want to do something really special, um, then you can get personalized 
matchbooks. Now, these were given as a little token at my son and daughter-in-law uh, that live in Denver at their wedding. And they were, of course, color coordinated to the palette that they had for their wedding. These are a really beautiful deep navy slate blue, and they've got gold embossed lettering that says Vodder. You too can have these, and we will put a link in the description box below. And if we've forgotten any of these links, because there's a lot of them, just make sure to ask us in the comment box and we will make sure to put up any missing links and you can typically find them in the community tab. It's also a good reason to subscribe to the newsletter because you can leave me a comment there that said, whoa, Linda, you talk about this and then you didn't prom you promised us a link and you didn't provide it. We do try to be good about that, but there's a lot of links. Um, and so these I think are really, really beautiful. You can also make them on Zazzle. Uh, there's a different place is where you can make them. But what a special gift for the person who has everything. And that's a, you know, that's another gift thing um, that now people are saying when you're going to give someone something, make it consumable, something preferably not plastic, um, but something that's consumable that they can use up. And this is, I think, a wonderful thing for, again, that person in your family, in your life that has absolutely everything. You can give them these really elegant, very classy, classic matchboxes. Um, let's see, is there anything else that I have forgotten? I have my mom growing up, she had a candle closet. <laughs> Um, and it was a closet that was devoted to nothing but her candles. I don't have quite that many. She was more, uh, she was more of the Yankee candle variety in the glass jars. That's not so much me. Um, but I do have a bureau. I do have a chest where I keep all of my candle accoutrement. And it is very much, I, I love to organize it. I love to pull something out to light it. I, I just love the, the luxurious quality of doing that kind of thing. Also, I know that it's all there in one place. Now, not only is candlelight romantic, we all look better by candlelight. It's very, very flattering, but in an ice storm, candlelight can be a lifesaver. So in addition to also having really beautiful candles, I also like to have boxes of what I consider to just be utilitarian candles. And I think this is something that you would wanna have in an emergency in case of emergency box. And I just have plain white candles like this that I like to keep on hand at all time. Now, candles that are in a regular size, like the little beeswax candle, or really any type of taper candle that won't stand up and fly right in your candle holder, then you need some kind of grip. You need some kind of adhesive that you can use at the base of the candle to ensure that it will stay in place because you don't want that candle falling over and getting something caught on fire. In that case, then, I would suggest using something like this candle adhesive stick -em which is just brilliant. You can see that mine is almost empty. I need to order some more. You can also get little wax dots that I find work even better, but they've got too much packaging for me. So I use something that is um, that I can use over and over again. You can also use something called museum wax. And it is, this is used for a variety of different purposes to make something um, easy, simple, and reusable if you want an adhesive that you can then detach and attach again. And I would recommend some of this museum wax. So who knew? <laughs> there was so much to learn about the artistry of lighting, caring, and designing with candlelight. Was there anything else on that candle etiquette list that I forgot to share with you? Please comment below. Let me know how you like to incorporate candlelight into your life in a safe and a very, very elegant way. But wait, I have one more tip. If you've forgotten to put the water in the basin of your votive cup and it has stuck to the cup itself, then just pop it in the freezer. Once it freezes, you can then tap it on a surface and it will drop right out.